One night a woman fell in from a boat into the ocean. No one saw her fall. The wait the waves were rough. Soon she glue grew glue tight. Then something bumped against her. A shark, she thought. Oh no. It was not a shark. It was a dolphin. Grint, grinny, grin, grintily, it pushed her towards the shore. Water, shallow water. At last, the she cared. Cr- cr- Cleared up, glared up, Claire. This is my son Alejandro. During first grade, we transferred him to a private school near our house. He was tested for reading and math, and we were shocked to find out that he was behind in reading. In an effort to help him catch up, he met with the school's resource teacher and he met with a reading tutor. Unfortunately, he was still behind at the end of first grade, so... At the recommendation of his teacher and the principal, we held him back. I will always regret that decision because it is something that still haunts him to this day. Halfway through second grade, it was my mother who suggested to us that we have him tested for dyslexia. We did, and the results came back that he was indeed dyslexic. We went to his school and told the principal and his teacher that he had been diagnosed and that he was going to need accommodations, and the school was actually really good about that. At the same meeting, I remember asking the principal about the best way of telling Ali that he was dyslexic. And I remember the principal telling us that she didn't like to use the D word and that labeling children is a bad thing and we shouldn't do it. I thought that was a really strange answer because here was a child who was struggling and he knew he was struggling. I felt that we should tell him and we should help him understand what dyslexia is and what it means for him. So we did. Since then, Ala's confidence has soared, and with the help of the school's resource teacher, and now a private dyslexia tutor, he has become a much stronger reader and continues to improve. Learning about dyslexia and embracing it has changed our lives for the better. Dyslexia is a um, neurologically based uh, disability. It affects the ability of the child to, um, or the person to acquire Uh, written language. Um, It's very hereditary, hereditary and it's it's, um, generally if there's a father who is dyslexic or a mother, one or one of their children is going to be is going to be dyslexic. Sometimes even um, it won't affect the mother and father. But when you when you talk to them, you find out. Well, there's an aunt, or there's an uncle, or there's somebody in in their family who has had a, a similar a similar problem with acquiring written language. Um, it can be unexpected in that the child appears to be very bright, which dyslexic children are very bright. And in many cases, the high cognitive ability can almost work against them. They're compensating so much. And people don't realize that they're really struggling. And so they may go on and perhaps do average work. But maybe they were meant to do more than that. You know, maybe they were meant to do above average work. And uh, they were meant to be super, super successful students. And they never get that chance because the right tools were not there to find out what was really going going on with them. Uh, Before Kendall was diagnosed with uh, dyslexia, she was... (sighs) She was frustrated. I was frustrated. It was very difficult. Um, I assumed she was being stubborn. It was very hard on her when it came time to read because the teachers kept telling me, you need to spend more time with her, spend more time with her. And I felt like we were adequately spending the time she needed to learn how to read. She just couldn't pronounce the words, follow the story. She didn't didn't know how to read. Early on in in Logan's school career, I would say as early as preschool, we noticed struggles, struggles learning his letters, his numbers, retaining that information in his, in his head. When we would talk to the teachers, almost always we would hear that he, he's not reading at grade level, that he's struggling with his spelling. We would also get some reports about behavior issues because he was struggling and sometimes he would just give up and then when there's nothing to do in the classroom because you don't understand what you're reading, a second grader or a third grader can become a behavior problem. Jessica was in um, third grade when 
we um, kind of hit a wall here at home with homework. She had been fine up until then, and um, and then it came to a point where she would just get frustrated almost immediately. She would spend hours just doing simple things that were sent home, and um, there were a lot of tears, a lot of late nights, a lot of fits. We slowly started to see her self-confidence just tank. I mean, it just went down and down and down. She started to feel really stupid and didn't want to go to school, and it was a hard time. Um, I noticed that Lauren was having difficulties uh, between kindergarten and first grade. Actually, in kindergarten, her teacher approached us towards the end of the school year and said, um, I think that Lauren needs some extra help with reading. Um, she's not grasping some of the concepts. She had difficulty decoding words. She would recognize a word and then not be able to say it again 10 seconds later. Um, and that was when I noticed that there were, there were some issues. Before Cole was diagnosed with, with dyslexia, uh, doing homework was a very stressful time of the day, uh, both for us and for him. Uh, part of it's because, you know, we didn't, we didn't know what his troubles were. We didn't understand it. I had heard from his teachers that, you know, he was being lazy, not wanting to do his work, so that's what I thought it was. And in reality, he wasn't grasping it. So it was frustrating for both of us as a, a parent. I just, I thought he could do better, you know, and because and, I was listening to them telling me he was lazy. So um, it was just very frustrating. And I remember him crying, and then I would cry, and then it just, it became horrible. So it, it was not a good time at all for us. First grade was much like kindergarten, you know, with the coloring and playing with the toys and all that. And I remember sitting at the, the table in the classroom, you know, that's the way the teacher had everything set up. And we can play with the toys and stuff, but you had to finish your homework assignment, usually the classroom assignment. And I'm sitting here trying to figure out, well, I don't get it, I don't understand it. You know, I'm, I'm looking at these words because at that particular time, I didn't know how to read. Now, I don't know if you're supposed to know how to, know how to read in the first grade. I knew I didn't know how to read in the first grade. So by the time I got to second grade, it was just, I was just there. <laughs> just looking at um, this book and all these words and supposed to know this stuff. You know, because I didn't, I didn't pass. I, I failed. In fact, they held me back. Then um, the rest of it is pretty much a blur somewhat, but I kind of figured out that um, I wasn't going to get this, and this is as far as I was going to go. So what I did was learn how to be quiet, try to be as invisible as possible, you know what I'm saying? Because you don't want to draw any attention to yourself. And I was aware that the other kids was getting it. I wasn't. And so drawing is what I pretty much started doing to keep my, I mean, other than just being, feeling like part of the furniture, giving myself something to do while I was sitting there. I knew there was a problem, but it seemed like nobody around me seemed to respond to it, you know. My mother was trying to be supportive of my circumstances because she knew something wasn't quite right. And I do remember her buying, like, um, um, paper and pencils and would sit me down and try to work with me and all this kind of stuff. But my father, his, his thing was he just blamed me. He, he said I was stupid and dumb and never amount to anything because he was in agreement with the teachers and stuff. So, you know, the, he made matters a little, he made it a lot worse than it, it should have been. Presently, I'm, I'm suffering from that. I'm paying a great cause because I'm shut out of everything because at 49, I have no formal education. Never been to high school, uh, never been to college. My schooling stopped at, uh, to me, in the, the second grade, as far as I'm concerned. I think that's where it all stopped, to be perfectly honest. Because when I failed, somebody should have did something. When I was in um, grade school, I had always wanted to actually be a, a pilot because I love uh, air, airplanes, you know, then and now. But as time went on with my drawing, I started realizing I was more interested in designing aircraft more so than flying aircraft. Because now I'm to the point where I want to get into designing spacecraft. But unfortunately, due to my circumstances, it's just, that's just a dead dream right now. And I hate that. I really hate that. Uh, school for me was not easy. It had various different levels of failure, had various different levels of success. 
especially my uh, elementary days, uh, I definitely had the teachers that saw me as lazy, um, wasn't trying. And then I had the teachers that, you know, just viewed it as, oh, he'll get it someday. And in high school, I was definitely a C student. I mean, the only thing I got an A in was gym. And uh, I was happy that I, that was my one A. And I, but although I, I liked history, so I, w I would uh, do fairly well in history, but English and math, uh, any of that stuff was big struggles for me. Um, when I took my ACT for the first time to get into college, um, I think I scored a 13 on it, um, which wasn't great. But then somehow, through the resource um, in high school, I got to take the ACT again, and I scored a 19 on it. And that time, it was read to me, and it was also non-timed. I still remember to this day sitting with my uh, high school advisor as you're getting ready to start looking at colleges, and he said, you should stop thinking about college start looking into trade schools and um, you know that's probably the path that you're going to end up in life and I walked out <laughs> um, I walked out of that situation feeling okay you can accept that or you can change it and the way you're going to change it is um by not giving up, you know. It's easy to throw in the towel and say, okay, I'm dumb, I'm stupid, this is your lot in life. But I knew I wasn't dumb, I knew I wasn't stupid. I had value, I had a lot to offer. Um, I found myself, I I'm, I'm, was very social, I was very creative, I didn't have problems speaking in public. So, you know, to me, that piece was the part that I was gonna go for. Um, so then when I went to college, um, I knew that I had to find a school that was not the big mega school. If I had the big mega school, I would have been lost. Um, so I found a smaller school. I went to Bradley University. Uh, the classroom sizes were smaller. It was only about uh, 4,000 students on, on campus. The teachers were actually, the classes were actually taught by the professors versus a TA. Um, the cl average class size was 25 to 30 kids. So it was almost like going to high school, but you had more independence. I mean, I knew my professors and I would go to my professors and they would work with me. So that to me was huge. Um, and again, I had to take the philosophy and I joke about it today to my kids. I, I said, C's get degrees because that's what I had to get. I had to get C's. I'd get B's every once in a while. But at the end of the day, I got a degree and I'm happy for that. Some of the common myths about dyslexia uh, fall under common questions and common uh, characteristics of dyslexia. For example, reversals. Many people think that uh, individuals with dyslexia see things backwards, when in fact that is a myth. They don't see things backwards. It's actually a, a, neurologically, uh, a neurological issue within the brain. Um, another myth is that dyslexia is rare and, in fact, Dyslexia is not rare. One out of five people have dyslexia, and most of them will go undiagnosed their whole life and will struggle. Some of the myths are that it's a vision problem, and it's not a vision problem. It cannot be corrected by colored lenses or overlays. It cannot be corrected by any kind of vision therapy. If vision therapy does correct a problem, then it's not dyslexia. Um, there's a common misconception that it's a hearing problem or an auditory processing problem, which is different than phonological processing. Another thing people believe is that dyslexics cannot read. That is absolutely not true. Dyslexics can read up to a point, but around third grade, if not sooner, they hit the wall in reading development. Another myth is that people believe dyslexics will never read well. In fact, dyslexics can become excellent readers, great spellers, wonderful writers, if they are given the proper interventions. Um, oftentimes I am told, well, that's just kind of a junk term. It doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, I even recently had a parent um, that took a, um, their child's results uh, after being diagnosed with dyslexia to the principal, and the principal said it does not exist. There's no such thing as dyslexia. Some of the, the comments and stories that we get from parents, 
you, you, you're not sure if you want to laugh or you want to cry about them because they're just, they don't make any sense. We'll have a parent say, you know, my child's in third grade and he's not reading, but the teacher's telling me that he's not trying hard enough or he's just a little slow or he'll grow into it. You know, I had one parent tell me who was from a very affluent school district when her child was in first grade that uh, the teacher said to them, or might have been an administrator, that not everybody's child can be smart and somebody has to stock the shelves at Walmart. How do you tell that to a first grader? How do you sell them that short that early? If I could do anything for the children and individuals with dyslexia, it is to root out this insidious myth that children who can't learn to read are dumb or are stupid or not working to potential. What I want everyone to understand that there is reading and there is intelligence. And the reading circuit is about putting together all these parts with a child's intelligence. The intelligence of a child is not shown by whether they can learn to read or not. And it is an assumption that is, that is shared by so many people and makes children who can't learn to read feel stupid. So we have a big problem in American education. The problem many of us are trying to work on in this field that affects anywhere from 2.5 million to 10 million school kids, we're not allowed to name when we're working with kids in schools. Dyslexia. But what I think is important about labeling is the context matters. Labeling is not always bad, neither is it always good. And it can be disabling if what you're saying to a child is that dyslexia is a litany of deficiency, a list of things you ain't good at. It doesn't have to be that way, but we have a duty, we who are adults have a duty to change perceptions so that people understand the talents that go along with dyslexia and those who have it in the way their brains operate. It's a package of strengths and some areas of challenge. More to the school system, however, is labeling is sometimes relieving to a child, and that's true whether it's a mental health issue or a learning issue, or a health issue that's beyond a mental health issue. People need to get a, a, a handhold on something in order to know it's not about them, that whatever they're contending with that might be a challenge is not a character flaw. I know that um, people don't like to refer to the word dyslexia. Administrators, teachers, even parents perhaps don't want to acknowledge that that's it or say the word or address it. But all I can say from a parent's perspective is we saw our son hit a wall. Emotionally, we were frightened for him because he was shutting down on every level, felt so frustrated, felt so unworthy really, and incapable. And that word dyslexia changed everything for him. It gave a reason for why he struggled, so much so that he wanted to do his end of the year fifth grade report and presentation on dyslexia, presented it to his classroom, felt empowered, like this is why I struggle. There's actually a word for it, there's a reason for it. I'm not stupid, I'm not lazy, I work hard, probably harder than most of you have to work um, for maybe a lesser grade, but this is why. And so that word gave him purpose and meaning and um, it really did change everything for him. We were able to point to other people, professionals, inventors, presidents, lots of people in powerful positions who had dyslexia too, and it, it allowed him to believe in himself again. Like, oh, I can do it too, and I can excel at other things, and I can be, I can be successful. Well, after, after the diagnosis, we reviewed the material, my husband and I, with the physician that diagnosed her. We had some interest, you know, a list of things that we could do to help Kendall. We brought the um, information back to her teachers, and to the principal, and we spoke with them. Um, the teacher still didn't quite understand what dyslexia was. That was kind of difficult. Um, she tried, I mean, she tried to figure, you know, try to help us and figure out what that was, but the understanding is, it's, it's not there yet quite in the community. I mean, she didn't grasp the concept that this wasn't something that she was just going to outgrow. Now, talking with Kendall, she was a little bit more disappointed and devastated. She didn't quite understand it. 
you know, I'm just like everybody else. She didn't want to go to resource classes. She didn't want to do the things that she needed to progress with her reading and with her understanding and how to learn. And then once we sat down on several occasions and we went through the different information with her, one day she was she was like, wow, mommy, this is working. You know, she'd sit down and do her homework and she wasn't as frustrated. There wasn't as much crying, you know, more temper tantrums. And I think she was understanding that, you know, this is okay. This is, you know, this is okay. This is who I am and I'm special and I'm going to, I'm going to use what I have and it's not a bad thing. Um, personally, I think Cole, when he was first diagnosed, he was very embarrassed about the fact that he had dyslexia. He was always saying, why do I have this? And, you know, how come I get everything? And um, it wasn't until I sat him down one day, because he was getting teased at school, that I suggested his tutor come into his classroom and talk to the kids because he doesn't have a physical disability that they see. And ever since then, Cole's become more proud of the fact that he has dyslexia and it's not such a curse to him anymore. Most public schools give um, a standard battery of tests that has three reading tests on it. It has a test of comprehension, a test of vocabulary, um, and a, a decoding test, and, and that's it. Some have a fluency test. Um, and so they take those, they average them together, and then they tell you, well, uh, what you know, what the average is, and where your child lies on that on a um, on a standard scale. But you need to know more about a child's reading than that. You need to have a um, a good decoding survey. You have to know where is the breakdown in the reading. You know where where is it happening? Is it happening at the decoding level? Is it happening at the comprehension level? Is it happening at the the word level with with vocabulary? And you don't get that from a regular um, public school evaluation. When a parent thinks that their child might have dyslexia and they're looking to find somebody to test them to determine whether or not that is their problem, they need to make sure that they are looking for a person who is qualified to test their child with dyslexia. So that person needs to have a real understanding of what dyslexia is. They need to ask them for what types of tests they're going to be using. And there are a list of tests that are um, accepted in the dyslexia community as having the ability to determine whether or not somebody has dyslexia. They need to, to believe in dyslexia and that it's, that it's real and be able to use the term in their, in their report that they give them a really nice long report that shows them what their scores are and how that, that backs up their diagnosis. So it needs to be very detailed and it needs to be explained to the parent in the way that they understand. And they need to have the educational level that would qualify them to be able to do that. For parents who are just getting the, the knowledge, the information that their child is being diagnosed with dyslexia, it can be very scary. And I believe it's scary because they don't understand or they don't have enough information. And I think it's important that they take a deep breath and make a commitment to do some research and read the, the good books that are out there. Um, it's not a death sentence at all. And the more information they have, um, the better they're going to feel. And the exciting part is with that information, they're going to be able to help their child learn to read. And that's the goal. It's the parent, I believe, that is so afraid that they keep their eyes shut and they don't get the information they need so they can't parent that child and advocate for that child. And then the child struggles to learn to read and we want to get past that. We want the child to learn to read and then become the whole human being that the child wants to be. A dyslexic person primarily needs two things. They need Orton-Gillingham tutoring and they need accommodations. And those are the two things to fight for. Now, you might and most likely will have to go and seek elsewhere outside of the school to get the Orton-Gillingham tutoring. Um, but that is critical. And it is attainable. It is something you can provide. And so you as a parent have to weigh, am I going to wait for the school to catch up and figure this out? Or am I going to take the bull by the horns and seek the help that I know my child needs, that I know is successful, research-based, scientifically proven, and most supportive for my child, I just got to do it. I've used Orton-Gillingham for probably 25 years, and 
um, it, it's, a, it's just a successful program. I think it's successful because it is so structured. You don't leave room for error. You teach every letter, you teach every sound. Um, you don't go on until the child knows what has been previously taught. You're always building on success. I think the multi-sensory part of it is one of the most important parts. The child hears it, they see it, they feel it. There are several Orton Gillingham based programs tutors may use to teach dyslexics to read. It is really, really important that the tutor is well trained and certified in the program in which they will be using. As a tutor, I have seen firsthand the impact tutoring can have on a child. When they start with me, they're an emotional mess, they're very low self esteem, failing school. After their proper intervention, and hard work, they have become successful students, their confidence is growing, and they have gotten to the point where they actually enjoy reading. Actually, last summer, after Logan had been tutoring for about a year and a half, he read two novels over the summer, which is so unusual. We'd come up into his bedroom and he'd be reading a book. And so that was amazing. Um, we have noticed, and even the standardized test scores that just came home this summer, what an improvement his were um, over last year. So we know, we know, we, I can see his spelling improving, I can see his writing, and he still struggles with getting his thoughts on paper, and there's still other tools that we use to help with that, but we are definitely seeing an improvement. And just his self-esteem that he's capable and able to do it, it's been really, really neat to see. Every day I see a little light come in her face when she does something, spells something, when she reads something that she wasn't able to do before the tutoring. And um, Alexa is in third grade, her sister, and um, Alexa the other day yelled down, how do you spell whatever? And just yelled out how to spell it. And I was like, oh, pretty, yay, hooray, hooray. And, um, uh, so I see many celebrations every day in her progress, it, and it's so exciting to me to see her confidence just build and build and build. From the moment she was diagnosed till now, where it's what, two years later, she's just done phenomenally. She actually had the choice last year in school, towards the halfway period of school, if she wanted to participate in spelling tests, and it was her choice, and she chose to do so, and she did very well. Her math skills have went up greatly, and she's reading and wanting to read. She no longer, you know, comes home and says, I hate reading, I don't want to read ever. She's um, asking me to order certain books for her, you know, certain books that she's now interested in, chapter books. I mean, that's a huge step for us because she wants to know what the next chapter is, you know, what's the next book about. So it's she's excited about reading. She's excited about school, and for us, that's that just, it's a joy. It's a joy to see in her. Classroom accommodations are essential for students with dyslexia who have ever, either not gotten the right type of intervention yet or it hasn't, they haven't had it long enough that the gap is closed. Classroom accommodations are something the regular teacher does to do two things. One, to avoid accidentally humiliating this child. How do you humiliate a child with dyslexia? You accidentally reveal their weaknesses to their friends. So things they shouldn't do, ask them to read out loud in class. Make them participate in a spelling bee. Have them come up to the board and write the answers to the homework where they'll see his spelling issues and his handwriting issues and so on. The most important thing for a teacher is to keep his struggles private. His academic struggles are nobody else's business but his, the parents, and the teachers. Nobody else should be aware of it. But there are other types of accommodations that teachers should also provide so that he can access the same curriculum as everyone else and prove his knowledge even though he cannot yet read, write, and spell at grade level. So for instance, he needs to learn what's in the textbook, but he can't read what's in the textbook yet. So allow him to listen to his textbook on audio. He knows the answer to questions. I, trust me, he spent hours and hours and hours studying for tests, but he can't write down the answers that he knows in acceptable form. So allow him to just do oral testing. If he does have to write answers or essays, Grade it on content and ignore the spelling. Simple, easy things that cost no money. They don't require changing the curriculum. They just require an awareness by the teacher that these are necessary and how to provide them in a way that doesn't make them look different. 
early intervention in the classroom, even before they get to the classroom, if you possibly can do it, um, can really make a big difference in the outcomes. And the sooner, the better, because their brains are more plastic when they're younger. The sooner, the better, because if they can, if you can short circuit that failure cycle, which carries lifelong scars, all the better. Um, outside of the classroom, it's also important. They need all kinds of supports that feed their self-image because you know, most of the day in the school, they're getting negative messages about themselves. So if there are things that can be done that allow them to, do, to work on their strengths or do things that they enjoy, positive support from the family or activities, all of that is really important because it feeds their self-esteem and they have to have a healthy sense of self to do that fight, to do that battle during the school day. Despite their areas of struggle, dyslexics tend to be gifted in other areas, people skills. They can make outstanding teachers, politicians, motivational speakers, and community leaders. Um, they tend to have amazing visual abilities. This helps them to become amazing artists, sculptors, filmmakers, hairdressers, architects. Dyslexics can become strong athletes based on their intuition and discipline skills. And due to their logical and hands-on way of, of learning and thinking, they can excel in the scientific areas such as medicine, engineering, and computers. They're not afraid to take risks, which is a wonderful quality. It can be Frustrating if you're the parent of an eight-year-old child who's jumping out of trees or doing things that are seemingly impulsive, but it's a great quality if you struggle with some things, but you pick yourself back up and you say, you know what, I'm going to try it a different way this time. There are an estimated 35%, they say, of, of entrepreneurs are dyslexic. And an entrepreneur is a risk taker, right? Is somebody who sees, um, sees things differently. We talk about the out-of-the-box thinkers who might look at something completely differently than the average person and come up with an idea that no one else has thought of because of those skills, those talents. I think it's tremendously important to foster the strengths if you have a child with dyslexia. I think that they spend a lot of their early educational experience in what feels like failure. And as parents and people who know them intimately, they're so much more than that. And they might need some convincing in those early years. So really celebrate and give them many, many opportunities to feel and experience what success is like. Um, because for many of our kids, it can be the lifeline that gets them through the rough patches. Becoming an Illinois Supreme Court judge uh, probably is a result of my entire life having someone helping me along the way and directing me. For instance, when I was a little girl, uh, I really didn't do well in school. Now I know why, it's because I had dyslexia, I have dyslexia. Um, but people would encourage me, you know, you are doing really well. It's not, it's okay. My mom and dad never really cared whether I got A's, I got C's. But what they did encourage me to be was a happy kid. Uh, do what you like to do. So off I went. I went to be a gym teacher for the Chicago Park District very successful. I ran programs for several hundred kids, day camps, started the Special Olympics in 1968, and was very successful. I got married, and my husband encouraged me to go to law school. He says, you know all these things about kids with disabilities. You should be using it to help them. And I said, but law school, you know, I can hardly read. I can't spell. Um, he said, oh, I'll help you. So I did. And I, it was, I was successful. I, I got C's. I, I only got one or two A's my whole law school career. But I had that person encouraging me about what I could do. Some of Lauren's strengths, um, you know, creativity, 
uh, you know, art. That's something that, that we've been pretty happy about. You know, when she draws something or, or paints something, you know, it's, 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 she does a really nice job with that kind of a thing. She also has a really good um, big picture understanding of, of things. Um, yeah, even you get even math. Yeah, she's not great at math, um, but she understands at a high level the concepts. You know, the macro uh, level of what's going on. Yeah, getting the nuts and bolts is kind of difficult for her to put all of that together. But man, she she does understand what's going on. Um, socially, she's a very socially aware um, young young girl. Um, and she's very well liked by by I think everybody in her class. And every everyone in her school really seems to like her. You know, they they hug her when they see her, and 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 she seems to really have a great rapport with with just about everybody. I see dyslexia as a gift, especially in Jessica, with her um, heart for other struggling people. Mm. And I think that um, for her, um, that's grown a sense of compassion in her and a love for people that um, she might not have had if she hadn't had to walk through this journey the way that she has already. And um, to me, that's a gift because I get the blessing of that as well by her love. But um, she's so good with other people. And a couple weeks ago, she told her tutor that um, one day she might like to help kids that are struggling like she is. And um, it almost made me cry because it, it's just such a gift that she could find a purpose in what the world wants to say is no good or or a stigma or stupid that that she could find hope in that and and a way to make it a good thing. We need to be very mindful of not making enemies of those we need to be part of changing American education. My sister is a school teacher in Wyoming. My sister-in-law is a special education school teacher in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania around the Thanksgiving dinner table, I get in trouble talking bad about teachers, nor do I want to. But if you remember the phrase army strong, I think we need to come up with something called teacher strong. And if you're gonna be teacher strong, you are going to have to endure that you are operating in a very big system that does not always provide you the rewards you deserve. You're gonna to have to find a way, as many teachers do, and I admire them for it, to provide your own rewards, to remind yourself you're there for the kids and to take some risk. It's not easy, and it is not often rewarded by the system, but it is rewarded by what teachers care about most, and that is results with the kids. Now, I want to be clear. This means high standards for teachers. This means doing the things you need to do in a system to take those who are really not motivated by doing well and giving them something else to do. But for those who are doing well, find more and more ways of celebrating their success. None of this is easy. I don't want it to sound Pollyannish, and I'm not doing this just to have a good Thanksgiving dinner with my sister and sister-in-law. I believe in this very deeply. I have the greatest uh, admiration for what teachers do, and yet we know that teachers need to be part of a change. I think most teachers want the best for their students. I think they really want to do all that they can. I think they want um, uh, children who are achieving, um, I think they want, they're in teaching because they love children and that's what, that's what they want to do. I think sometimes, just because of the situations, the many children, the lack of materials, um, the, um, you know, administrative complaints, um, there's, there's a, a million things in a day that can pull you down. And I think, um, that, that also can affect the way that, that we look at children. A child who can't read, all of a sudden becomes a problem instead of a challenge. I think you have to look at kids as, as a whole child. You can't look at, well, this one can't read and this one can't do math and this one can't write. You have to look at them and you always have to look at them in terms of what are the things that they can do. If you look at their gifts and you concentrate on those, you're gonna be able to help with the deficits. We've gotta start with the universities because if the teachers coming out don't know any more than the teachers from 30 or 40 years ago, we're not fixing anything. We need the universities to start working in you know, their, their programs. They need to, teach, especially special ed teachers, or reading teachers. These teachers need to know what dyslexia is. I, I had a couple friends that went back to college and they said they learned more about dyslexia from me than they learned in any of their classes. And one did go back with a special ed certificate. And she said, maybe we got five minutes about dyslexia, if that. And that's now. I mean, I might have expected that 20 years ago, but not now.
when we work with teachers, they, they, they say we want this information. They email us all the time, they come into our classes and they say we really want this information and then they always put in big capital letters with an exclamation point, why didn't I learn this in teacher training school? So they really want this information and they have, they, and the ones that are going out there and getting it themselves, I applaud them, but it's not as many as it needs to be. Every teacher should be required to have one course on dyslexia in order to graduate. What it is, what the warning signs are, how to help, what won't help. Because unfortunately, dyslexia follows them all lifelong. So I'll tell you, I talk to a lot of junior high teachers and high school teachers who say, I can't believe how many children I have coming in as a freshman in high school who are reading at the third grade level. What am I supposed to do with them? How do I teach them high school science when they can't read the book? So it's not just elementary school teachers who need to know about this. All teachers in public school and private school should have a class on dyslexia before they're allowed to hit the classroom. So they'll understand what they're looking at and what needs to be done and they can warn parents so that parents can take action early. I think the biggest challenge to raise awareness with educators on what is dyslexia um, is first getting the states to acknowledge that dyslexia is neurobiological. A lot of states don't even have it <laughs> at all, uh, don't recognize it, and thus these kids who could be identified so early, they could be screened in pre-K and kindergarten, and then provided in general education um, great supports that really aren't that difficult and science tells us work for these children, they'll be all reading by the second or third grade, or almost all, at least 98% of them. So the states have to acknowledge it, our policymakers have to acknowledge it, and then we have to give the tools to our teachers. When anyone asks me what we could do about children with dyslexia, the first thing I want the world to know is that it exists. It is, a, it is a different organization of a brain that is a wonderful brain, a brain that has been here long before reading occurs. So the absolute first thing is a reconceptualization of dyslexia for everyone. The second is that that understanding is made available to the child, to the parent, to the peers, and to the teachers, and to the school systems, not just in this country, but around the world. Literacy affects everyone. Our children with dyslexia should never be deprived of access to literacy. This is probably one of our most interesting brains as a species. We cannot have it lost in its contribution to society. Right now, much of what we know about dyslexia comes from the careful work of many, many people over many years showing the importance of phonologic ability and the importance of early environment, stimulative language, um, proper instruction in how to read. Reading can be mistaught. We have very, it's very easy to create what are called curriculum casualties, where you do not appreciate how reading is built and what should be reinforced. Emphasizing phonological skills, phonics, alphabetic principle, vocabulary, these are things that have been recommended by the National Reading Panel that are healthy and important. Currently, brain science doesn't add much to that, but it offers a promise that we can begin to understand differences between people that are very subtle and yet very profound. I think in this day and age with after 20, 30 years of science that has proven, one, that dyslexia does indeed exist, that it's not reading and writing backwards, and that there's real methodology to help these children learn, that the time has come, we've got to stop the cycle. And, and, and we, want, we need parents to speak out. And then that's one reason we came up with decoding dyslexia groups. We are looking to raise dyslexia awareness. We're hoping to get parents to resources and supports in a timely fashion, quicker than we may have gotten there ourselves. 
And we also want to make sure that we're out there sharing our story with policymakers and people who actually have the ability to affect change. From that three-point mission statement, we've developed also talking points or policy goals. And those are to have a unified definition of dyslexia in state education codes, to mandate early screening, early intervention, teacher training, and access to assistive technologies. Dyslexia is a global issue. It affects up to 20% of the population. That's a lot of people. Every classroom has at least one student who struggles to some degree with reading, writing, and spelling. Parents are frustrated because they don't understand why, and teachers want to help these students but don't know how. One word, dyslexia, can change all that but it requires knowledge, understanding, and support to move forward. Parents, it's really important to know that it's never too late to get help for your struggling child. No matter how old they are when they are diagnosed, you can get them help. They can become proficient readers and they can get their self-esteem back. It's not a hopeless situation, but it does require work on your part. You will have to do research you will have to educate yourself so that you can learn how best to support your child at home and advocate for him in school. Teachers, how many of you have students in your classroom who seem so smart, but yet they struggle so much? How often have you been banging your head against the wall, trying to figure out what you can do to help this child, believing there is an answer, but not knowing where to find that answer? Take it upon yourself to learn more about dyslexia you can help give parents an answer, and you can be the reason a child with dyslexia will find the road to success instead of the road of constant struggle. Schools. If your primary function is to educate all children, then you cannot keep turning a blind eye to something that affects one out of five of your student population. Dyslexia is real. And please understand that early dyslexia screening and intervention is smart. It makes sense. It saves time and money, and most importantly, it removes roadblocks that can keep our children with dyslexia from reaching their full potential. And finally, policymakers. You have the ability to pass laws that make it mandatory for all schools to screen every single student for dyslexia and to also provide children with dyslexia with scientifically proven instruction. You also have the ability to pass laws that require every teacher training college to include at least one course on dyslexia so that new teachers can be better prepared to meet the needs of all their students. With all of the dyslexia research that exists, there is no reason why a child who struggles with reading, writing, and spelling cannot get the help that they need to become successful students. Please visit EmbracingDyslexia.com where you will find links to websites that provide more information about dyslexia and to organizations that have made it their mission to raise dyslexia awareness around the world. Every child deserves the opportunity to be successful. We can do this. We must do this. But we have to do it together. Mm -hmm.